Hello everyone, this is Nairi from Low Carbon Fasting. Our guest today is a very special person. I've been looking forward to this episode and we're finally able to, to record it. Now she has a master's degree in nutrition and integrative health. She's a licensed nutritionist and she's certified in ketogenic nutrition. And her specialty is therapeutic carbohydrate reduction for the management of type 1 diabetes. Beth McNally, did I leave anything out? <laughs> no, I think that's great. Thank you. It's really nice to be here too. Finally, we're doing this. <laughs> well, first of all, welcome to Low Carbon Fasting. Thank now, you. let's tell the audience what we're talking about. We are going to talk about how Beth got interested in nutrition and specifically type 1 diabetes nutrition. Um, and then we're also going to discuss the mental health burden of diabetes. Now, that's a topic that I haven't covered on this channel. Mm -hmm. So if people are under the impression, hey, we're all doing fine and, you know, we never have any worries and everything is fine, as long as you lower the carbohydrates, your life is going to just magically, uh, you know, <laughs> uh, become better. Um, it's not always the case. Mm -hmm. So. Let's start with your interest, Beth, in uh, type 1 diabetes nutrition, because a major life event happened mm -hmm. that changed your direction, right? Tell us. Yeah, it, it did. I actually worked in international education, um, and I also had worked as well. Um, I live in Canada, so I worked in the Canadian federal government as well when I was younger, but my son was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes at the age of nine in 2015. And so that involved a big shift um, in the work that I do now. And we had him following the sort of standard of care conventional guidelines. And um, my husband and I just couldn't really figure out what we were doing wrong because no matter how much we tried to get it right, his blood sugar always seemed to be on a roller coaster. So we eventually found out about Dr. Richard Bernstein's methods and we had, it was 2015, so there wasn't a lot online. And we heard um, there was a radiologist in Australia named Dr. Corey Stapleton and he gave a presentation that was recorded on YouTube. And we had first found out that you could use nutrition to help with the management of type 1 diabetes. So that's how our family got started back in 2015. And after about a year, um, you know, right away, we normalized our son Lachlan's blood glucose levels. I mean, I, to be honest, I didn't have that much hope. I thought, well, how can this be that much different? I mean, we're still feeding him foods that are fairly healthy. And right away, his blood glucose levels normalized. And I could not have believed the change that that made. So after about a year, I decided to go back and do, do my master of science degree to try to figure out, well, what is happening in the body? Because we've managed to do this, but I don't fully understand how. And so that's sort of um, how I got into the space. I didn't originally think that I would be working as a clinical nutritionist, but once I, you know, um, graduated and did my internship, I worked with people with type 2 diabetes and prediabetes for about a year and a half. Uh, and then I just kept having more and more people with type 1 saying there isn't really anybody who knows how to do therapeutic carbohydrate reduction, you know, can you help me? Can you help me? Can you help me? And then I made that shift. And I really focus on uh, families with type 1 diabetes, specifically um, helping parents of children with type 1 diabetes, because that's my lived experience. And I also feel there's a gap in, um, in the clinical world in helping families be able um, to understand how the body works in type 1 and how we can use food to get better results. So that's sort of the background in terms of how I got into this space. Um, so do you work with um, adults as well, type one diabetic adults? Or just yeah, I do adults? some. I do some one-on-one -on -one clinical nutrition work with adults, but mainly parents and families. And I I do have uh, self-directed and uh, gr guided group programs, and those are all for families. So really focused on children um, with type one diabetes. I have had a lot of interest from adults as well. Um, but I thought I would start with children. So I've been doing this now for about a year and a half. Um, and I do have more adults asking to see me as well. And I, I love working with everybody. 
I've just mainly focused on on parents of children. Right. Let's start with the belief in mainstream medicine that children mm -hmm. need carbohydrates to grow and especially for the brain to develop mm -hmm. properly. But type 1 diabetic children, we can see in the low carbohydrate space, they're thriving mm -hmm. without the fast, rapid acting carbohydrates because we're still eating carbohydrates. We're eating carbohydrates from cucumbers or mm -hmm. low, other low carb veggies. It's not necessarily a no carb diet we're following, but low carbohydrate diet. But what would you say to people saying, you know, but they need they need whole grains to grow and the brain needs that glucose, right? <laughs> what would you say? Yeah, actually, I think it's a good question. And I remember when we changed my son Lachlan's diet and we kept, my husband and I kept saying, wow, okay, we normalized his blood glucose levels. His behavior has changed. You know, there were a lot of positive things. Lachlan was feeling much better. When he played sports, we weren't as scared that he would drop low. We were, you know, using lower amounts of insulin because he was eating lower amounts of carbohydrate. And so things had gone really well, but we were asking ourselves, does he need carbs to grow? That was my main question because mm -hmm. everywhere we went, you know, that's what we read. And so then when I went and did my nutrition degree, I went back and said, where is this coming from? And so there is this huge document called the DRI, which basically was put together by the Institute of Medicine. I believe the first one came out in 2005. I could be wrong on that. And it was like a 600 and some page document explaining all of the different nutrients that humans need to um, eat in order to survive and thrive. And the carbohydrate section said, you know, we don't actually know how many dietary carbohydrates that humans need in order to survive, but we'll give a minimum of 130 grams because they actually did studies on breast milk and infants. And they had a sort of an idea that, well, maybe this is how much the brain needs to survive because the brain needs glucose to survive. And since that time, we have more studies because we understand that the body can actually make glucose when mm -hmm. it needs it. Um, there are two ways that it can do that. It can break down stored glucose or it can actually produce glucose from different substrates. And also we know that the brain doesn't just need glucose in order to survive. It can also use other forms of fuel that are derived from fat. And so, you know, now when we look at all of these children who have eaten a very low carbohydrate diet for many years, um, I'm actually not sure how tall my son is now. I know he is at least 6'2" but he came down last week for breakfast and I said, Oh, I think you've grown again. And he's just recently turned 18. So I wasn't sure he would grow much more than he, and than he is, but it is, you know, there are many, many children that have lived off 30 grams of carbohydrates per day or less. You know, my son is going into his ninth year of doing this, you know, and those children have been growing and thriving. And what's really important to understand is that Dietary carbohydrate is not an essential nutrient as long as you get enough dietary protein and fat mm -hmm. to make up the energy needs of that person. That's what's very important. And obviously, in order to grow, children need a lot of dietary protein because the amino acids break down and that's what allows the body to grow and to thrive. So you do need to make sure that they're eating enough food. Um, and that, you know, that's some that's part of the work that I do, you know, with the children and the parents that I work with is just to make sure they're taking in enough energy. Um, and the majority of people are. And oftentimes I find that when, when a child is not taking in enough energy, it's often not the type of foods that are being chosen. It just comes down to really simple things, which we see with high carb eaters or low carb eaters. There's not enough time at school. You know, they have 15 minutes before they go to recess or they're going to sports right after and everybody's busy and everybody's, you know, so sometimes it's not really, we need to add in more food. It's sometimes we actually need to say the food that was packed for lunch, people just need a little bit more time to eat the lunch. The children just need more time to do that. So that's what's really important. But no, the body 
can make glucose if it needs to. And people, you know, Yuri, people with type 1 diabetes know this because when they don't eat for long periods of time, their blood glucose levels go up. Well, how would that be unless their body was producing it and the liver is responsible for producing glucose, you know, when the body needs it. And along the same lines, we also know that when we're not eating carbohydrates and we're only eating uh, fat and protein, they're not what many people believe free foods. Mm. They have an effect on our, <laughs> on our glucose levels. So uh, like cheese, cheese and beef jerky. That's mm -hmm. you raise your glucose. You still need insulin for that. So, I mean, lowering the carbohydrates and maybe increasing fat and protein now is one thing. That's probably probably the easier part of the equation. Now, the mm -hmm. harder part that is how to dose for protein and fat. Mm -hmm. Um. And, and, you know, and the timing, the type of insulin to use, and also the timing of your injection. Now, these are the tricky parts, and people generally struggle with that because there is no one formula that works for all. Yeah, and I think it's a very, it's an area in type 1 diabetes management where there's a gap. Mm. So people who follow Dr. Richard Bernstein's method in his book, The Diabetes Solution, may not feel that there's a gap because they took Dr. Bernstein's method. And what they do is they weigh the protein uh, before it's cooked, and then they actually convert that to an amount of an insulin called regular insulin, which mm -hmm. has a profile, a time action profile that releases about the time that your blood glucose levels would be affected by the protein that you just ate. So Dr. Bernstein has one method, but it's the biggest question that parents have for me when they actually come into my program, you know, because I encourage them to go back to the diabetes care team. We focus on nutrition education. And I mean, I even had one parent last week that said my endocrinologist does not, he, he's willing to help me, but he doesn't know how he can advise mm -hmm. on dosing for protein and fat. And oftentimes when we're eating high amounts of carbs and we take a large injection of rapid acting insulin, that is sometimes helping us cover the protein and fat, not always, but oftentimes it will help with that. And so when you do low carb, I've done quite a bit of research myself to go, okay, what is out there? And anytime that I see theories about how to dose for protein and carb, it sorry, for protein and fat, it's always in the context of a higher carbohydrate diet. So that is the one area, and I actually just talked to somebody about this last week. I said, our next step is to write guidelines on how to use regular insulin and the best option for, you know, using extended or dual or square wave bolus, using an insulin pump in order to cover the effects on blood glucose from dietary protein and fat. And, and you and I both know, you know, because we live with type 1 diabetes, that you know, everybody wants a magic formula and there's no such thing. You know, even if we had guidance, it would be a starting point. Yes. You know, we're conservative with the very first time that we are trying to use that mealtime insulin dose. And then we record the results and we look at the blood glucose response after, and then we make shifts and we make adjustments until we actually, you know, have an amount of insulin and a type of insulin and the timing down so that it works. But the one thing... I don't know if you have found this, um, Mary, but my, my son went on an insulin pump last year and he already knows his regular insulin amounts for all of his meals. And so we said, well, let's try to use the pump to see how we could do this. And so we tried different, we, we looked at as much research as we could. We looked at other examples of other families who were doing this and we tried our best guess, our best first safe guess. And, you know, after about four weeks of trial and error, you know, my son just said, oh, Using regular is so easy. I don't even want to bother with this pump from real time insulin anymore, just because he was he just sort of knows what to do already. So there are many ways that you can do this, but I you know there are other people who just use their pump to cover protein. So, but it is hard to provide guidance on it when there are no clinical guidelines that um, that exist, and that's why so many people rely on Dr. Bernstein's method or a starting point, because it is a very specific and, and um, safe option to start to use regular insulin. 
But even Dr. Bernstein says this is, you know, this may need to change. So yeah, it's just a, it's just a starting point. Just which a I'm starting happy. point. Yeah, just a starting yeah. point. I it took me a year, maybe because I'm older than your son. <laughs> and you know perimenopausal as well but it took me a whole year to actually figure out how to use my palm and the mm -hmm. rapid acting insulin in my palm to cover the protein and fat mm -hmm. and and I had it worked out however and now you know I'm in Canada right and mm -hmm. I had it very easy to just walk in and you don't need a prescription you can just walk into drug mart and uh, shoppers drug mart i think that's what it is so yeah, it's yeah. right next door to us so i walk in and i'm able to buy insulin so i thought how about i try mm. our insulin okay and it threw me off and i <laughs> cannot work out when to take it how much to take it i actually tried it for about two weeks mm. only tiny bit of it is used and i just it's been sitting in the fridge i thought you know what mm -hmm. i had it cracked I had it, you know, worked out on my pump. Why am I bothering with <laughs> with the R now? Because it's a whole new adaptation it's and I true. really don't need it. But you're right. I could relate to that. So what? Yeah, it's the same <laughs> thing with lesson, right? You're just using different options. And I understand, you know, because I he really wanted to see, well, when I go to school, you know, I won't have to carry my regular insulin and then inject. When I'm at school, I could just use my pump. And, you know, people have lots of different you know, whatever works best for them, you know, as long as they're able to have stable blood glucose levels and, you know, ideally in the normal range is what we're aiming for. So. Mm -hmm. That's right. So um, I presume you want, um, and in fact, I know from uh, your uh, social media posts, I know how supportive your husband is, or, you know, or your other family members. So as a family unit, together, you're in the same boat. So you want the same part yeah. um, for the person in the family who has type 1 diabetes. This isn't always the case. And you know that, Beth, from experience. In fact, from the little experience that I have, and not specifically for type 1 diabetics, but I know how divide, divided families can be when it comes to um, specific dietary approach. Um, tell us about what you've seen in families where, say, I don't know, the parents don't agree on therapeutic carbohydrates reduction, for example. Yeah, that's a great question. One thing that I, um, I feel like I'm a, I'm a, an open-minded clinician. You know, we have people coming into the program for different reasons. They have different stories, different backgrounds. People are from various cultures. It can be hard, you know, sometimes harder for certain cultures to adjust if, you know, their mm -hmm. traditional diets are higher in carbohydrate. And so we have people doing different things. And I, you know, we talk about what the research tells us about the different levels of carbohydrate for type 1 diabetes, and people end up getting there different ways. You know, some people go all in 100%, you know, and they pick a start date, and then other people kind of ease in. What I, what I feel my role is in the example that you gave where maybe there's a couple and one parent thinks that the family should go low carb and one parent is hesitant or does not want to, you know, the hard, the wonderful point is oftentimes they're both wanting the best thing for the child. So, you know, uh, sometimes the parent who has done research on low carb is saying, I think this is going to be the best for health come, outcomes in the long term. And then the other parent might be saying, well, there have been so many changes with this diagnosis and our child's trying to adjust and let's not also change food. Or perhaps, well, the doctor has told us we need mm -hmm. to eat this many carbs or the dietitian has told us we need to eat this many carbs. So why would they tell us that? And, you know, there'd be another way to manage type one. So everybody feels confused. And so I think that, you know, they, they don't, they really don't want to go against what the doctor is saying in that sense. And so I feel that my job is to outline why a nutrition intervention can be beneficial in type one diabetes. My job is not to convince them what to do. That's every family's decision. 
But often when you open the lines of communication and we talk, okay, what feels hard about this or what, because oftentimes what feels hard is what people are stressed about, you know, and those concerns are valid. You know, sometimes they're like, I don't think my kid is going to adapt. I think my child is a picky eater or it's too expensive and we have three other children. There can be many reasons why there's hesitation. And so we start with why it can be helpful and what is happening in the body that is necessitating, you know, nutrition therapy that would benefit this. So how do we avoid diabetic complications? Because although it may be hard to change the diet in the long term, the quality of life of this child in having normal blood glucose levels will be completely different. So, you know, it, it's important that every parent know that. And I think in the type one diabetes community, especially at diagnosis, we're all so upset that this has just happened. And suddenly we have to give our child, you know, needles every single day, mm -hmm. every time they eat, plus mm -hmm. injections for basal insulin. It's a lot to take. It's a lot to take in. So pediatric and endocrinologists are not potentially highlighting all of the diabetic complications. And for me, I saw my grandfather who had type two diabetes, I saw his toes amputated when I was 17 years old. So immediately I, I, I thought, okay, I know this is the reality with a type one diabetes diagnosis. So I'm already there. What do I have to do to avoid that? How can we avoid that? And I find, you might find this interesting, the most motivated parents that come into my program had a relative with diabetic complications. And it, and it's very sad that that's happened. And it also is a, is a huge motivator. So it, it, it can be challenging. I, I have had parents email me later saying, you know, thank you, we're now on the same page. And, you know, we understand why we're doing what we're doing. Um, it can be more challenging when the couple has, is separated or divorced mm -hmm. um, because everybody's not living in the same house. And, and getting back to the, you know, what we are talking about today in the year, there's so much going on in terms of the mental burden and the stress of diabetes management, that when you throw that into a family dynamic that's already working on communicating and doing what's best for the child and figuring out life, um, you know, we really need to, I think, sometimes stop and go, okay, this is a lot for us to take in. Mm -hmm. You know, it's affecting our family financially. It's affecting my ability as a parent sometimes to work during the day because I'm looking at my child's CGM all day long and I'm worried about them at school or daycare or whatever the case may be. And there are just so many different things that are happening all at once. And so I really think it might help us in the type 1 diabetes community to start having conversations. You know, when I, when I started with my program a year and a half ago, I thought, okay, we're going to go in, we're going to explain what's happening in the body, we're going to talk about food. And then right away when we started meeting, I'm like, oh, wow, everybody just wants to talk about how you're dealing with the stress of this. And, there, and then all of the feedback comes back and saying, I'm not alone anymore. There are other people who understand what I'm going through. And so this year... In particular, I'm really focused on that. People are very stressed out by seeing the successes of other families that have like that, that that have these, you know, flat lines. And I think the flat lines are wonderful because it shows you what can be done and it gives you something to strive for. And yet a lot of people can feel um, like I can never, I can never do that. Or some people change their way of eating and still can't dial in that straight line. You know, so having those discussions and saying, well, like straight lines don't often happen. Like we're constantly adjusting in type one, right? So the body's, you know, reacting to various blood glucose reactions and we have a lot of different influences on what's causing that. And so we just keep, you know, trying our best to be able to deal with that and you know, I have many parents that have A1Cs in the fives and they want to get into the fours. And so sometimes you have to say, oh, do you know how well you're doing? You're doing so well. And I, I really want you to stop for a minute and take a deep breath and congratulate yourself. Because 
you know, you're in, you're achieving what very few people with type one diabetes have been able to do. So I think all of those things have been swirling around in my head lately. And I hope that as a community, we can have more conversations because I think when we feel that we acknowledge um, what we're facing and accept it, we don't have to like it, especially right after diagnosis, it hits you very hard. But if we can sort of accept where we are and then we say, okay, this is where I am. I'm gonna surround myself with other people who understand because let's face it, you know, you know, people outside of your immediate family that live with type one diabetes under your roof, they don't understand. They don't, they don't fully get it. Even if they're lovely people, they don't live it. And so if you surround yourself by a community and then you have this layer of hope by educating yourself and figuring out how the body works so that you can use food and insulin and exercise in a way that makes diabetes feel safer and not as scary. And so that's, I think, what I wish for all type one families, because I don't know what your experience was like, but we had like a wonderful team of diabetes educators for an entire week. And yet we still went home and went, I don't understand why he's going up, you know, to a, a 16 or, a, you know, a 250 and then down to a three, down to a 55, you know, so it's just, it, it's hard to deal with on a, on a daily basis when you have those types of fluctuations. Like I, I even say sometimes to the parents, like, look at this blood glucose roller coaster. Like not only does your child feel terribly, but that's like a stress inducer, <laughs> you know, and when you have that be a little bit more like this, everybody's like, okay, okay child feels better, you know, and, and, and it is our responsibility as parents to empower children. You know, I really have wanted Lachlan to feel that my job is, I think the greatest gift that I can give him is to manage his diabetes well, so that he can have a long life. And if he wants to have children, he can. And if he wants to do anything that he can, and I'm not perfect at it, but that's my, you know, focus in helping him with his type one diabetes. And um, it can feel hard to change your diet at first. And so many parents say, wow, I can't believe my child is adapting. And I said, you're not going to think they will. And this happens like even in the epilepsy world with ketogenic diets or other ways that you need to introduce you know, foods that maybe we don't like when we first try, you know, foods that are more bitter and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And it is always amazing how within three to four weeks, like taste buds adapt, you know, I don't know about you, but I could never eat a piece of traditional cake right now. It would, it would taste terribly to me, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, whereas before diabetes, I would have gladly had a piece of cake and enjoyed the taste of it. So children do adapt and they're more resilient and stronger than some of us think. And, you know, there's so many options that we can give them um, that I just think um, I, I would just never want anyone not to try because they were scared of those challenges. Um, you know, when someone, when a child, particularly a child is first diagnosed, there's that grieving period at home. And my assumption was that once that passes, that initial period, then everyone adapts. But from everything you've explained, that's not always the case. That burden of diabetes management stays with you. Um, I mean, I don't let it sort of defeat me or control me, mm -hmm. but it is a burden. It is a burden. I, 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 I'd be lying if I said, well, my straight lines just, just happen, you know, by magic. I'm monitoring closely. I'm managing closely. Mm -hmm. I'm correcting the low. I'm microdosing for that little high, and I'm following those trends. Yeah. All of that takes effort. Yeah. Um, so it does. I mean, I'm happy. I have type one diabetes, which mm -hmm. is actually a disease we can live with. Mm -hmm. We can 
keep under control, we can manage and we can actually live a full, meaningful life with it. So I'm pleased it is type one and nothing else that mm -hmm. be that I wouldn't necessarily be able to do anything about, right? So I, I, I kind of, for me, it's a blessing that it is type one. But the burden, the burden doesn't necessarily, you know, get easier. Um, I, I always say to people, look, someone posted their um, um, flat line. They posted it because they're also happy that mm -hmm. this week they actually had mm -hmm. that particular flat line. They didn't post the ups and downs from the rest of the week. They posted that particular graph that only shows you six hours on a particular day mm -hmm. and so so this is I think yeah we have to be more realistic about you know what we can achieve and and also not treat this as a competition um mm -hmm. you know who has who has the smallest standard deviation who has this the lowest a1c it's hard work as it is and um, my A1C went up and initially I was just so ashamed and I started what the heck I'm going to talk about it because it's my menopause it's yeah. terrible I could not do anything about it nothing yes um, and I just lived with it unless I was able to address the rest of my hormones my A1C did not come down mm -hmm. and but I did feel like a failure for a while mm -hmm. and I was just so ashamed just kept quiet and I wouldn't tell anyone went up to six and it's stuck at six it's not coming down and I hadn't put two and two together <laughs> and it was all because my hormones the rest of my hormones were completely mm. out of whack and yeah. I was able to address the rest of my hormones particularly the estrogen well and others as well and um and now I'm having you know my normal life back but people go through a lot of life stressors and how we have to be more compassionate and that's something that probably is missing and i'm very proud of the type one the, 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 the diabetes community very proud we really are mm -hmm. like exemplary oh. and something to be proud of however we do have division <laughs> within our community and um i think maybe we need to to unite more yeah and i think you know Actually, thank you for sharing that because i think that's helpful i think i think that you're right. I think we can lift each other up. And I, I've never known a community that is so supportive of one another. I mean, the fact that we can all talk and we, you know, because as much as our, most of the healthcare professionals that have worked in diabetes that I've ever met have been wonderful, caring people that got into it because they want to help people. But when you look at it, like they, they only spend about three hours a year, maybe with us, right? So really it's up to us to manage the condition on a daily basis. And I think, you know, I, I love when people post their flat lines because it is exciting for them. And I hope that other people don't look at that and say, oh, I, why am I not getting that? You know, so we talk about that a lot as groups of parents because a lot of people feel the same way that you do. Well, how come this is happening? You know, and it's like, okay, well, so let's figure it out. And you are so, you know, I would, I would say to you here, like, wow, how resourceful are you? But that 6.0 A1C motivated you to go. I need to uncover some, you know, buckets that I've never had to think about before because now I'm at a stage in my life where I need to manage hormones related to that. And so that, you know, that I can improve diabetes management in the way that I've decided is important. So I, I mean, we were both at the Boca Raton uh, Low Carb USA conference in January. It's the first time I met you in person. And the love in the room, you know, and it's just so, it's just like nothing I've ever experienced in my life. I feel very grateful that the type 1 diabetes community does wrap its arm around everybody. And I hope that when we talk about distress, we don't get people down. I just want other people to know they're not alone and that we need to say, okay, here's where we are. What can we do about this? And let's go to a place of hope. So that when I see someone else's flat line, that is my, that is my hope. That's what we're all aiming for. And, you know, there's so many motivating, you know, parents and individuals online that are helping with their pages. I mean, there's been a huge explosion lately of that. And I think it's because 
people want to help other people mm-hmm. as best they can. Um, and I, and I hope that people just feel that they're able to say things that you just said, you know, like the, the control, you know, wasn't exactly where I wanted it to be. And yeah, that can be hard if everybody else is getting those kinds of results. And in our program, you know, if Lachlan has a bad day, I'm like, this is, this is today for, for, you know, Lachlan bad day, meaning like he couldn't figure out why his blood sugar got away from him. Um, It's not a bad day, but it's just maybe not the, blood sugar control he wanted in that day. And so we had to make adjustments um, to it. So yeah, I hope that, you know, we can make people feel less alone. Um, I, I, I presented that visual and maybe we can include it in the, you know, the comments or in the section that comes with this recording, but about just like how complex type one diabetes is. It doesn't just affect, you know, oh, we don't have insulin. Now we need an insulin therapy replacement. We have so many things impacting the whole family, the caregiver, the individual that has type one and everything along those lines. And so, you know, I encourage the parents to just say, look, this is a lot to take in. And everybody says, no one has ever said this to me. And no one ever comes back and says, well, I can't do this. This is too much. They say, yeah, you know what? This is a lot. And my family has been challenged with this diagnosis. And my child has been challenged with this diagnosis. And now what are we going to do? You know, because this is a fantastic kid. And the children show us, you know, my child showed more than I did about what was possible. You know, he, I mean, I, I know every child is different. So they're going to react differently and they have different personalities, mm-hmm. you know, but he was always my guide because he, he handled things much more easily than I would, you know, where I'm worried about him as a mom. And he would often be like, mom, like, relax. You think it bugs me. It's fine. You know, and I even asked him actually before, um, I asked him earlier today, I said, I'm, I'm coming on this podcast with Nayiri and she's asking me these kinds of questions. We're talking about diabetes distress or the mental burden. So I said, would you mind telling us what was stressful when you were diagnosed? So he said, I said, okay, so you were diagnosed at age nine. You know, do you remember age nine to 12? Like you had to go to birthday parties, you had to bring your own food. You know, you had to play sports and sometimes you'd have to be pulled off the field to take glucose before you could go back on. So I asked him and he said, I remember suddenly we couldn't have cereal and toast. And at the time I was like, oh, well, that's terrible because I really like cereal and toast. (laughs) He said, he goes, I can't really remember everything else. So I don't remember being too bothered about all of that. He, He said, I guess if I remember anything, it was feeling unwell when I would have a high blood sugar and a low blood sugar. But we've often asked him, because birthday parties come up in our parent discussions and asked him, you know, how did you feel about having to bring your own food and not eating what the other children at the birth? And he was like, did I, did I not? He, like, he doesn't remember, mm-hmm. you know? So while we, like, I would go to the parties and it would be a little stressful for me because I felt badly for him. And now I am like, he didn't even really notice. He was just running around. He owned it. You know, so he kind of taught me and he recently turned 18, but I said, what's been stressful as a teenager? And he said, actually, the biggest stress has been sleepovers. So he said, I'm a very, he said, not now, but when I was 15 or 16, I'm a very sound sleeper and I don't always wake up to my alarms. So I was scared to sleep over in case I went low and not waking up to my low alarms. So he said that was that was scary for me. I didn't really want to sleep over sometimes, like if a bunch of my friends were sleeping over. So he also didn't like the fact that his alarms would alert in the middle of the night. And then he felt like he was waking up his friends. And he said, my friends said, oh, we don't care. It's totally fine. But he felt that that would be disturbing to other people. So I said, well, do you care now? Because, you know, sometimes he's 18. If he wants to go and stay at a friend's, he just, you know, says, oh, here's where I'm going. And you know, we work out, okay, so who, you know, I always take an extra um, mobile number or two of wherever he's going to be mm-hmm. and know what the address is, um, just so that if we ever needed a plan B and I had to be a backup, I know where to find him. 
Um, but he just said, well, he goes, I just have my own system now. And I just wake up and I'm not worried anymore. But when I was about 15 or 16, it was stressful. And I remember one summer holidays, he said, you and dad need to go away and leave me at night because I need to practice because I'm scared to stay alone. And so, you know, we put things in place where on a few nights he got to try that on his own so that he would feel that he could do it. You know, so sometimes, you know, I forget to ask him what he needs. You know, even even now, you know, sometimes I say, is there anything that would be helpful to you just to sort of, as you say, relieve some of this burden? And so sometimes he, you know, will tell me. And sometimes I think we forget to ask our children that about many things, but especially diabetes. You know, and I think it's fair to say when you go to the birthday party, you know, how how's that working out for you? You know, and if it really bugs them, you might not be able to change things because you want their diabetes to be managed a certain way so that they feel well. But, you know, the kids get to have a say or they get to work it out with you or they get to share their feelings and, you know, and um, and, and and don't get me wrong. Some children really struggle. You know, Lach just because Lachlan didn't struggle at birthday parties doesn't mean like some children really have a hard time, you know, mm -hmm. so then, you know, we have to support those children too. They have different personalities, different approaches, but talking it out with them, I think is really, um, you know, really important so that they can take ownership and they can make decisions about, okay, so how's this going to look? you know, in terms of how is this birthday party going to look? And some of the ideas that the parents have come up with are just so amazing. You know, like I had one mom and she said, look, the food is served at the end. So I, we just come in, he has three hours of the party. He runs around and he really wants to eat what they eat. So we are like, okay, you know what? At this point, we're going to, I'm going to pick you up a little early and we're going to go home and eat your food. And he's like, great. You know, or there's, so there's a whole bunch of different things that are happening that people make work for them. And it might not be what you want to do, um, but it's certainly, you know, you can find ways um, so that their health is always number one priority. And the children, um, you know, the, our job is not to protect them so much that they don't have to face, They you know, they can avoid adversity. You know, if anything, I find my son with type one is, you know, probably is the most resilient, you know, and he's always looking out for people that have, you know, something that might be challenging for them. Mm -hmm. It certainly makes you resilient. I mean, it's made me resilient. Mm -hmm. um, I was five when I was diagnosed. So again, I didn't even notice any dietary change because I was put on a low carbohydrate diet straight away. Mm -hmm. But everyone mm -hmm. in the family, even I lived in my extended family. I lived with my grandparents at home. Um, mm -hmm. Everyone was eating the same as I was. And so everyone was eating low carbohydrate diet. So there were oh, no desserts at home, amazing. nothing like that. So this is why I remember every birthday cake my mom would make, make me. Of course, there were natural sweeteners or anything like that at the time. It would mm -hmm. actually be proper flour-based cake with real sugar. But it was from birthday to birthday. And I just have one slice. I remember every birthday cake, my eighth birthday mm -hmm. cake, ninth birthday cake. I remember every single one of them because they were just once a year. Everyone, no one was eating desserts around me, so I didn't mm -hmm. notice that. But for me, part <laughs> specifically, the biggest trauma I think was the um, the injections, mm -hmm. um, and I'd be physically held down because I just would rebel. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, so yeah. I wasn't a partner who was in it with my mom and grandma, and so I needed my injections, and yeah. I would kick my arms and legs around. I'd just fight and fight until I accepted it. Mm. I owned it, as you put it. And What made you accept it, do you think? Do you remember? I have no idea, but I think it was you get tired of mm. throwing tantrums. Right. And it was just mm. uh, one injection per day. I think it was just every morning and that was it. Mm. I don't remember the type of insulin, but it was just once, once a day. Um, I think by the time I was eight, 
I was injecting myself and oh. it gets tiring, oh. right? You throw yeah. a drama, you know, it's going to come, <laughs> you adapt, you adapt. Yeah. But for me, so that was one reason I, I love, that's one reason I love my pump. I don't mm -hmm. like, I don't particularly want the manual injections. So um, anyway, well, I'm glad you have the pump so that you can, you know, because that, you know, obviously it's still, you know, very present in your mind. It's three years of. You know, it's, I remember it just like today that those traumatic, like being held down and screaming and, oh, I remember all of those. So uh, mm -hmm. I remember my mom's and grandma's like helpless cases. What do yeah. we do now? She's not taking it. So <laughs> It was, yeah. I remember that. I remember doctors being called. I remember a pharmacy. We had a pharmacy across the road. The pharmacist actually walked in. And I was like, why is this guy here? Because mm. he was just trying to support the family. I had, mm. I needed my injection. Yeah. I did. I think I probably did that for about two years. And then I got used to it. But it does make you resilient. It yeah. certainly does. Yeah, that's that's an interesting story. And imagine... I mean, we hear of the distress of you as a child and then imagine the distress of your mother and grandmother for two years having to do that feeling, you know, how hard that would have been and so hard for you. It, it must have been tough. I, I, you know what? I've never addressed this with my mom. Um, mm -hmm. I think I should sit down and ask how, what was it like for her? The stress, mm -hmm. the trauma, the grieving, because she didn't even have, the community around her yeah so we're in a better place now because you come online you type in type one you type in type one low carb and there are at least five six groups that pop up but yeah. there wasn't that community so in my school i remember being the only one with type one diabetes mm. it was not as common back then was yeah. growing up yeah that's true that's true and um now there are you know places you can go even in 2015 um we started in november the beginning of november and i think we stumbled on type 1 grit in january or february of 2016 and i felt like i opened like pandora's box i'm <laughs> like there's somebody else doing this with their child i i couldn't believe it and instantly i felt better i'm like okay we're not the only ones you know, because everybody thought what we were doing was extreme. And so we didn't know what else to do because it was working. Um, but it's hard when you, yeah, it's hard to be alone and do it. And you're alone, it's hard. Um, right. Um, let's come back to the sort of divisiveness within families. Mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned about that you know, families where the parents are divorced, the challenge mm -hmm. is bigger because you have to educate each parent, perhaps separately. And if there are already arguments between parents, then that can have a, that can have an effect on their strategy and how to manage their child, child's type of diabetes as well, sadly, because if it's a battleground, then type 1 diabetes gets, <laughs> becomes the ball as well. So how yeah. do you deal with that? Because that's, that's challenging. You know, I found, you know, so far, I know everybody's, you know, could just be the families that are registering for our programs, but I've seen some really beautiful situations, right? Like people who are divorced and then both are coming and they're trying to learn as much as they can. And we're trying to figure out, okay, how can we do this? You know, because sometimes, and I see this in families, um, you know, where the parents are married as well, but oftentimes there's one parent mainly in charge of everything. And that is really, um, you know, I mean, some people wouldn't find it burdensome, burdensome, but some people worry that no one else knows what to do. So they're really worried, well, something ever happens to me, nobody knows how to even decide on the amount for an injection you know and so um you know working that like, getting help you know even if maybe the situation of your partner is they work all the time and that's not a possibility well 
who else is in your life? Who else can you reach out to? How can you get some help? Um, you know, we recently did a survey at, at T1D Nutrition, and it was so helpful because, you know, we're trying to guess at what people's needs are. So we were like, let's ask people what their needs are. And, you know, one of the things that did come back that a few families had in common is, can you help me explain to the rest of my family what's going on with type one so that they can better understand what we're going through and what we need? And, you know, and I remember those feelings, you know, in the early days, maybe it's not true, but I'm pretty sure, or I think my sister's and mom and aunt, and they probably thought I was crazy. No, maybe they didn't, but that's just what I worried, you know, because it just felt every time we had a family dinner, type one diabetes is new when you're trying to, okay, now I'm at someone else's house for dinner. How, you know, how do I figure out how much insulin and when are, you know, when are you eating? And I need, you know, so you're trying to figure all of that out and it's just stressful, especially at the beginning. And then you sort of, build, you know, you know, you know, you build your skills and then it gets easier. I remember it was about the one year mark. And I hate to say that to people because people think a year is so long, but it was maybe a year after diagnosis and I was cooking something in the kitchen and I went, oh my gosh, this is easy. Like I don't have to think anymore. I just know what to pull out of the fridge or the cupboard or the freezer. And I can just put the food on the table and I don't have to concentrate. So hard. <laughs> And it felt like such a relief. And so I say to people, you know, if you if you signed up for a course to learn a different language in six weeks, you wouldn't expect to be fluent. So if you just be just know it will come because like any skill, you just have to practice it. You know, so if you don't know how to cook, maybe that's what's standing in your way. OK, so let's work on like, OK, what can you prepare that doesn't involve cooking skills? And then maybe we can work on cooking skills next. So there's all these things where sometimes a nutrition problem isn't what do I eat? But I need some information or some skills to be able to pull this off. You know, and that can feel hard sometimes. And so or, you know, everybody, we don't have enough time. You know, so it's like, okay, how do we, how do we carve out the time if this is a priority? You know, sometimes that becomes the first problem related to nutrition that we try to solve. Yeah, it does. It does get easier once it becomes your way of life. It does get easier. Um because I started low, well, I was raised on a low carbohydrate diet, although no one called it low carbohydrate diet at the time, because that's, that was the diet that was prescribed to all diabetics mm. at the hospital by the diabetes um, specialist. And so as a type one diabetic child, it was the same diet for me. I, I, it was just accepted. Um, mm -hmm. This was, of course, pre-rapid insulin. And so this was the 70s. And that's, that's how I grew up. But, um, but when I then, everything changed when I came to the UK to study. So I came to the UK to study and I found out, oh, you could eat anything you wanted and mm. take rapid acting insulin. Rapid acting insulin changed it. Yeah. And that wrecked my health, I would say. But then when I found out about low carbohydrate way of eating, it was 2015. Mm. Uh, 2015, there wasn't too much information online. There was some information, but certainly not as we find today. So, um, and, uh, and it, you know, initially I did it just sort of, I did transition very slowly. I started, you know, kicking, okay, the pasta's gone, no more pasta in the cupboard. And then it was all the homemade bread was gone because I made bread at home. It's supposed to be healthier, right? <laughs> but flour mm -hmm. is flour, but it doesn't, doesn't know the difference, however. So that went, and then all the fruit went. And then you get used to opening your fridge and seeing meat mm -hmm. and more meat <laughs> and eggs and low mm -hmm. carbohydrate vegetables. So, you know, there was like the, the fruit compart, the drawer was now filled with low carbohydrate vegetables. It's an, it's an, you know, it's an, it's an adjustment, but once you get adjusted to it, then it's just so simple. Yeah. You said it doesn't really require much thinking. It's easy. Yeah. But it seems, it can seem daunting at first. I felt like it was daunting. You know, I said, oh, I remember Lachlan had a, he was in grade four and his teacher said, so how long will he eat this way? And I'm like, well, I'm not sure, but I don't think he can eat 
this way for too long, it seems very different. <laughs> you know, I had no idea what was in front of me. <laughs> and, um, you know, and so, uh, you know, and then you see the blood sugar change and you go, I remember, you know, he was on, um, he was only using a glucometer. He didn't have a CGM in 2015. And so we were tracking things on the, uh, using that. And my husband, Matt would take the data because he was in market research and he'd put it into a little graph in Excel. And when I saw that, I literally felt like somebody punched me in the stomach. It was a good thing, but I, I went, Oh, wow. Oh, Oh, he's never not normal. And I realized, okay, you know, he was young and he was under our care all the time. And we were keeping close tabs on him. Of course, you're going to have highs and lows regardless of how you eat sometimes, but it was just night and day. And I instantly in my head said, okay, so this is what we do. This is what we now do. Um, and there's a bit of a, you know, uh, I don't know if you'd call it a mourning period because I was so grateful to have this option because for two months, you know, we just felt like, are we not following the instructions? Well, <laughs> you know, we just thought, why can't we seem to get this right? Um, but, uh, you're not used to not eating the foods that you used to, that you're used to eating. And you had mentioned earlier in year about how the family is divided. I think probably the thing I see the most is, um, one parent and the child might follow this way, but then other members of the family don't follow the same way of eating. And I think there can be many arrangements but I really think you have to make the decision as a family. How is this going to work so it's clear to everybody? And, you know, we do tend to see it being easier when everybody switches. But I don't, you know, that's everybody's prerogative. I think it's, you know, people have to do what's best for their family. And I am, you know, I'm not a judgmental person. I, I'm like, what is going to work for you? You have your own reasons for doing that. And sometimes maybe the other parent take, needs more time to come around, you know, and there are lots of stories where, oh, and we went here and then she ended up eating high carb again and went really high. But very quickly, the children come back if something happens and they will say, oh, I didn't feel well. Or, you know, so... I even had one mom share with me last week that her son, you know, said, you know, mom, I sleep so much better. And he, you know, he's young. Like he's, you know, <laughs> the fact that he would even notice that. And he just said, I just feel so much better. And, you know, thank you for doing this. I think the mom was shocked, you know, and, you know, it, it hadn't been, you know, necessarily the smooth road, you know, but within a month, he realized, oh, I feel better every day. My blood sugars are more stable and more normal. And, you know, so children can see what you're doing and they can feel it, right? So we need to be that role model. And um, I think sometimes it can just feel daunting, especially because when we have young children, life is very busy. So it really, you really have to say, okay, this is a priority. You know, if I put in the effort now, the long-term benefits of this are, are pretty enormous, you know, from terms of the quality of life. Because one thing that I think a lot of people don't get, and this is what can frustrate me about um, sometimes when my parents go back to their endocrinology team and they don't get support. A lot of them do get support, but then a lot of them, um, are advised not to do this. And I'm like, it's not just the blood sugar that's stable. Like once the child feels better and you're reducing the carbohydrates and you're reducing the insulin, we have less variability in both blood glucose and the effects of insulin. And then what we have, because we have more stability, we can more safely aim for normal blood sugars and the child feels better and we have less risk for hypoglycemia or even severe hypoglycemia. And that's the biggest thing that everybody's really scared of. And, you know, even the post-traumatic um, stress syndrome disorders that we have that are related to severe hypoglycemic events, 
Like the, the research shows that a mother who has lived through a severe hypoglycemic episode of her type 1 diabetes child, they all have PTSD, right? So if we can eat in a way that reduces that risk, why wouldn't we? And so that stable blood sugar, I always think about, well, that leads to a more stable family environment because not everybody's on edge all the time. Yeah, those uh, blood sugar roller coasters actually are <laughs> mood swings. They are your mood yeah. swings. So every up and down is just changing your mood. So you have mood swings during the day. It's your blood sugars having that effect on you. So That's a great point. And you know, when Lachlan, when we changed his diet, he had been had type 1 diabetes for almost two months. And he would come home off the school bus very, very tired. And I didn't even notice this at the time. He was nine. As soon as we normalized his blood sugars, he started talking differently. So I'm like, oh, he kind of had almost like a bit of a baby talk, right? Like he'd be like, mom, I'm tired. And I'm doing, you know, he'd come home and he was sort of whiny. And, and, but he talked in this high pitched voice, which I didn't notice. And about two days after low carb, he came home and started talking to me like he always had pre diabetes. And I went, oh my gosh, he is talking normally. And I didn't even realize he hadn't been, you know? And I thought, now that is a side effect of the diet that I would never have thought about, like a positive side effect of the diet that I would never have thought about. So sometimes when I hear about these stories about children with type 1 diabetes had bad behaviors, like I think about what you say, Neary, I think, oh, that poor child, they're probably having you know, huge fluctuations in glucose levels and they can't control their moods or their behaviors as easily. You know, one day my, uh, I had a po uh, pod failure. So I'm mm -hmm. at the tubeless pump Omnipod and, and it's so very rare for me, really rare that I would have uh, a pod failure. So one day I did at night. Mm -hmm. So I was tossing and turning and I just wasn't, I was feeling nauseous and I thought this is just unusual. It's middle of the night. So what's happening? These were before the hot flashes. I would have put it down to the hot flashes. Of course, <laughs> it was more recent, but this was like four or five years ago. Mm -hmm. And I woke up and I checked my blood sugars and it was 180 and 180 is actually 10 in our measurements here in Canada. Mm -hmm. So um, the UK and 10, according to diabetes uk and of course according to the ada is well that's the normal range right but mm -hmm. i actually felt sick mm -hmm. i felt sick it woke me up so imagine if your child is running high blood sugars every single day they're going to feel sick mm -hmm. it's a horrible feeling yeah. Just as much as I, I hate hypoglycemia because it makes you feel awful, mm -hmm. actually high blood sugars also make you feel awful, except that when they become your norm, then that's it. You know, you just become aggressive and you get used to feeling sick. Yeah. Yeah. We always knew when Lachlan's blood sugars went high before he had a CGM because he'd pick a fight with his little brother and he never did. <laughs> <laughs> so we were like, can we test your blood sugar? <laughs> You know, that was one thing that we always used as a cue before we had that. But yeah, and it's interesting because, you know, when I asked Lachlan, what do you remember when you were 9 to 12? What do you remember about what was hard about diabetes management or what was, you know, that's what he said. I, re I hated the feeling of being high and then being low. So very similar to what you experienced. And as parents, you know, we can't feel that. So we don't, we can, we can only know what they tell us. Yeah. Very young children don't know how to tell you what they're feeling necessarily, mm -hmm. um, especially, you know, blood sugar related feelings. How would you be able to verbalize, you know, feeling aggression, feeling angry and feeling um, nauseous and tired and um, the eyes aren't seeing very well and all of mm -hmm. that happened to me that particular night and I was actually 10 mm -hmm. <laughs> imagine people running that eye every single yeah. day I was there I was there before so before mm -hmm. low carb that's what my blood sugars were 
So my yeah. was, he was 9.8. You probably felt low when you were in normal range back then, I would imagine, would you? I would go through different um, finger prick, prick testing glucometers because I would get so frustrated with them. Mm. Every time I checked, it was high. And, and I couldn't understand why I was a failure because I couldn't control my blood sugars. Because I was under, under the impression that this rapid acting insulin is supposed to <laughs> work like magic. And so you just eat whatever you want and and just take the insulin. So no matter what I did, I couldn't couldn't get mm -hmm. my blood sugars down. So it was so frustrating. I just dump one and then go and buy another one. And then my blood sugars are still high. And no one ever told me, don't eat the carbohydrates. Actually, my mom did at one point, and I said, no, um, they know what they're talking about here at the diabetes mm -hmm. clinic. They said I can eat anything. Interesting. I take insulin. I, told, I actually told my mom, you're not familiar with this insulin because it didn't exist when mm -hmm. I was young, but this is this is supposed to act rapidly, and it's supposed to work, and I just didn't think, that, but it's not working. Yeah. <laughs> it's not working. I yeah. wasn't given the option. I think this is a big hurdle for many, many people because they are not given the option of a different way of eating. Yeah. And it I doesn't agree. have to be super ketogenic necessarily, but just lowering some of the fast, fast acting carbohydrates. Yeah, I agree. And I wish that was the one thing I was upset about when we found out. I was like, why? you know, because our Lachlan's diabetes care team, like they were the nicest people. And I was like, why didn't they tell us? Like, can't, why couldn't they just give us the option? And then, you know, I went back and did my degree and I'm like, oh, they have no clinical guidelines that allow them, you know, if they really, if they're following, you know, their directives, they, you know, they may be able to support us if we go to them. But until the guidelines change, we're not going to see, you know, changes in how you know endocrinology um works in you know in regard to this so i really think we need to push for those changes because we do see openings you know through the diabetes organizations that you know certainly low carbohydrate diets are and very low carbohydrate diets are an option for type 2 in fact you know it's all about you know reversing or improving type 2 diabetes and the fact that it isn't making you know having a bigger uh, place in the type 1 diabetes space makes no sense. Yes, they are two different medical conditions, but blood sugar dysregulation is what they have in common. So when you add the input of a high carbohydrate food that automatically increases blood sugar as soon as you eat it, why wouldn't that be the same? So I really think that we need to continue to encourage, you know, the option because right now it's all about you know, individualized nutrition therapy, you know, and it's based on food preferences and health goals. And I'm like, well, if a family or an individual with type one wants to do this, yes. can we please find a way to support it? You know, but we do need to not have it be, you know, we were doing this for a month, pulling our hair out and then just happened to stumble upon a YouTube presentation. You know, it just seems, you know, like what is going on in the world? <laughs> you know, so I really encourage um, you know, I, I really encourage families and individuals to keep, you know, advocating for these types of changes because, you know, and there are a lot of us who are working on the clinical side, you know, to do this more often. And I encourage any dietitians to get a hold of me to directly if you have concerns or if you have questions. I know when I went and did, you know, my nutrition dietetics program, we were like, absolutely do not restrict carbohydrate for children but it was all about the classic ketogenic diet, you know, the four to one, where you'd have four mm -hmm. grams of fat to one gram of protein plus carb, you know, and often those, those classic ketogenic diets were restricted in energy. So often 75% less energy, you know, fewer calories than what the child required to grow. So of course you may have concerns about growth when that happens, but that's not the kind of, you know, nutrition therapy that we're doing in type one diabetes for children. You know, they're eating plenty of uh, dietary protein, enough dietary fat and nutrient dense carbohydrates that don't spike blood sugar. Mm -hmm. you know? And we have many, many examples of children who have grown beautifully and, 
you know, are succeeding, you know, in life, they're going to school and they're academically doing great and everything along those lines. So I really, you know, encourage people, if you're interested and you're a clinician and you have concerns, like I would like to provide that safe space, right? Call me, email me, you know, tell me your fears and concerns and what's wrong about this and let's talk it over. You know, I don't details. yeah, I don't, yeah. Your details will be below so people you can uh, email Beth. All of her details and the website will be below. Oh, thank you. Yeah, and I just, you know, I don't think every family is going to choose this, but I think every family should be allowed to choose it if they if they desire. Well, on that positive note, <laughs> <laughs> we're going to wrap this up. So I think the next time I speak to you, it will be, it will actually be Lachlan next time. Oh, yeah. So bring yeah. him on. Uh, he'll be a young man. So well, once his exams are done, um, I'd like to bring him on. Yeah, With, that would be great. Master Kendall's son, Michael, so the two of them can come and inspire maybe other young people. Because we know it, young people listen better and engage better with people their age um that's that's we we all know that so i'd love to bring him on and maybe michael and they can maybe speak to people that once their age they can share their experiences about you know what it was like for them and how they're managing that up one now yeah, yeah that sounds great that sounds great and i do agree like, i often Believe it or not, I actually don't love always talking about Lachlan in terms of a personal side of things, you know, but everybody says, no, 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 we need to know well, what happened here so that we have an example, you know, for our own children. And any time that we've done anything where the, you know, the teenagers are involved, I'm always like, oh, wow, there's so many parents that are, you know, showing their children these teenagers. So I thought, oh, that's of course, I would have wanted the same thing when Lachlan was nine. All I wanted was an, probably an 18-year-old, you know, who had grown and it had worked and didn't need carbs to grow. So, yeah, we, we all are looking for that inspiration. So thank you, Neri, for what you're doing because it really is helpful. And the type 1 diabetes community is so lucky to have you because you have, you know, been able to bring uh, so many stories and examples of sort of what's working in the type 1 diabetes space. And I know we talked about you know, mental distress, but I hope people take it as, okay, you know what, I'm not alone. Other people are going through this and we can all work together to lift one another up and have hope for our children that there is a way to get better diabetes outcomes. So I hope people are going to leave with that today, you know, because that's really um, what I think a lot of people need to hear in order to feel that it's possible for them. That's a beautiful message to end this with. Thank you so much, Beth McNally. We'll have to do this again. Thanks, Amir. Thank you for having me. Bye for now. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.